I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken. So to speak. Season 3, Episode 6 of the Bodybuilding Legends Podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Redcon 1, Old School Labs, and Florida Alternative Medicine. All right, welcome everybody to episode number six of season three, where we talk about the 1981 Mr. Olympia. And our guest on this show is Winston Roberts. And for those of you who know bodybuilding and have followed the IFBB for many years, Winston was the general secretary of the International Federation of Bodybuilders, dating back all the way to the 1970s. He worked very closely with uh, Ben Weeder, president of the IFBB back then. And uh, Winston was actually, as you'll hear in our interview, he was actually in charge of uh, writing the Constitution for the IFBB and also for the uh, for writing the Judge's Handbook. So he was very instrumental in the very beginning of the IFBB when it really got organized and they were trying to get into the Olympic Games. And we brought Winston on the show today because he was a judge at the 1981 Mr. Olympia. And of course, in uh, episode number one of season three, we talked to the head judge, Roger Schwab, but Roger himself was not judging the show. He, we just went over all the judges' scores and we analyzed them. So it's going to be really interesting today to talk to Winston Roberts because he was a judge and of course his scores did count. And so we're going to get his views on why he placed everybody where he did and what he thought the strengths and weaknesses of the top bodybuilders were. As the years have gone by, I think most people consider Danny Padilla to be one of the top guys in that contest, along with Tom Platts and Roy Callender. And many people feel that uh, Franco Colombo did not deserve to win that contest. So Winston has some very different viewpoints on that. So we're going to hear him talk about that. In addition to that, Winston's going to talk about his whole career in the sport. He's got a lot of great stories. He's seen a lot of competitions over the years, a lot of great bodybuilders. He's got a lot of experience in the sport. So it's always great to talk to someone who's been around for so long and has such a history of the sport. In fact, Winston has so much experience. He had so much to say. He had so many great stories that uh, it is actually a longer interview than normal. It's about two hours instead of an hour. So we do talk a lot about the judging, which I thought was fascinating, where he uh, talks about the three different rounds of judging. Because as I said, Winston wrote the book about judging. So he said the first round was about symmetry. The second round was about muscularity. And then the third round, of course, was posing. So we talk in uh, in depth about that. And he brings up some of the old school bodybuilders to uh, illustrate his points. And then we do get around uh, to finally to talking about the 1981 Olympia, but it's probably in the uh, last hour of our talk. So if you want to hear that part of it, just uh, fast forward to that. Otherwise, it really was a fascinating interview with Winston Roberts because the guy has so much experience judging these top bodybuilders. It was really a, a great lesson in judging from one of the best. All right. We are sponsored today by Redcon One. So I want to thank uh, Aaron Singerman and Redcon One for, again, sponsoring Season 3 for the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. And at Redcon One, they believe in working hard for achieving your goals. Whether you're killing it in the gym or you're running a six-minute mile, Redcon One has something for those willing to put in the work. They have a premier clinically dosed pre-workout called Total War that is the perfect companion to your workout to give you any, the extra push to break through your mental and physical barriers. And then you can fuel your body after those workouts with the revolutionary MRE. And MRE is the only whole food complete meal replacement with protein made from salmon, chicken, beef, and eggs, and complex carbs coming from sweet potatoes and oats. And it also contains 10 grams of fat from MCT oil. This is the best tasting complete meal you will ever have. So go to redcon1.com and try the very best sports nutrition has to offer. Redcon1, the highest state of readiness. And as a tribute to the show, you can enter the discount code LEGENDS and get 15% discount off your order. And we're also brought to you by Old School Labs. You know, with so many supplements on the market, it can be hard to know which brand is the right one. But as a three-time Natural Mr. Universe and the first Natural Mr. Olympia, the quality of supplements and knowing what I'm taking is very important to me which is why Old School Labs is giving you 12% off your purchase. So just go to oldschoollabs.com and use the code LEGEND12 at the checkout to get a 12% discount. 
Old School Labs is the only brand that I use, trust, and associate my name with. And Old School Labs is the brand that I personally use to place high in the Masters Natural Mystery Universe and many other competitions. It is a brand you can trust and a brand that values the golden age of bodybuilding. So for great results, keep it old school. So thank you to Redcon One and Old School Labs for sponsoring another edition and for another season of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. Well, I got an uh, email this week from Tom Platts himself, the Golden Eagle, and I guess he saw some of the stuff that we've been putting on about uh, the 1981 Mr. Olympia. So Tom sent me an email and he said, hey, I got a lot to talk about with the 1981 Mr. Olympia. Give me a call. I'd love to do an interview. So I, of course, gave Tom a call right away and we tried to get that set up, but Tom's schedule filled up too quick, so he won't be able to to do another interview with me until around the Thanksgiving time. But hopefully we can get a really long interview with Tom Platts because he's still one of the real legendary bodybuilders in the game, someone who's still very popular 30 years after he competed. So hopefully that'll be coming up soon. But we do have the Dorian Yates interview part two up on my website, and it's also on YouTube, of course. But if you go to the bodybuildinglegendsshow.com, and you can see under our video section, part two of the Dorian Yates interview is up. So check that out. I was talking about that last week. I was having trouble getting that up, but we did get it up right after uh, we did the last show. So you can check that out. And I've also got the uh, Mike Ashley interview ready to go pretty soon. Should be up in another week or so. That's going to be a two-parter as well. So we will have part one up probably in another week. And of course, Mike Ashley, for those of you who know your history, he was a great bodybuilder in the 1980s. He won the uh, 1986 IFBB World Championships, Mr. Universe, and he was a natural bodybuilder. Mike made it very clear to everybody that he was a drug-free bodybuilder throughout his whole career. So really remarkable that someone who was drug-free was able to not only get an IFBB Pro card back then, but also progress all the way to the top of the sport. He won pro shows, took second to Gary Strideman at the Night of the Champions, and he took second to Sean Ray at the very first Ironman Invitational. And then he ended up winning the 1990 Arnold Classic because that was the only drug tested Mr. Olympia. And at first, Sean Ray won that contest, but then Sean was found to have failed the drug test after the show was over. So then Mike was rewarded the title because he was in second place. So Mike's going to have a great interview with us. And that should be coming up, like I said, within another week or so. All right. And then we are going to be working on season number four for the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and that's going to cover the 1990 Mr. Olympia. So I'm hoping to talk to some of the competitors from that contest. And uh, that was the only drug-tested Mr. Olympia ever. Uh, Joe and Ben Weider at the time wanted to try to get bodybuilding in the Olympics, and they thought a good move to make would be to have the show drug-tested, and they were going to start at the very top. So that's why they drug-tested that year the uh, Mr. Olympia and also the Arnold Classic. And uh, they also drug tested the big national level shows that year, the NPC Nationals, I think the USA, and the North America. So it was really a different kind of year, and then they never did it again. So we hope to talk to uh, some of the people involved in that contest, people who saw that contest, or some of the competitors that were there, because it really was a, a moment in history that will probably never be repeated again. So we are working on that, and we should have those shows coming up soon. And I also want to mention we're brought to you by Florida Alternative Medicine, where age is just a number. If you want to feel great, optimize your energy levels, burn fat, and balance your hormone levels to maximize your potential, then go see the experts at Florida Alternative Medicine and Weight Loss. They have a certified and knowledgeable staff that will work with you to achieve your goals and get you the results you've been looking for. They offer a wide range of services to ensure that you will not only look and feel amazing, but also be comfortable knowing that they're there for you every step of the way. They have very competitive pricing along with their quality products and services, and there are just a few additional reasons to give them a call. So give them a call for more information and experience firsthand what sets them apart from the rest. So you can contact them at flalternativemeds.com. That's FL for Florida, alternativemeds.com. And if you mention the the code LEGEND, you will get a free consultation along with 20% off your packages. All right. So again, I want to thank Redcon One, Old School Labs, and Florida Alternative Medicine for sponsoring this episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. And here is our interview with Winston Roberts, one of the top judges and officials 
in the IFBB. Here you go. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and we have a very special guest as we're talking again about the 1981 Mr. Olympia, season three of our podcast season. We have Mr. Winston Roberts joining us from Canada, and Winston was one of the top bodybuilding promoters and also IFBB judges during the 1980s, so it's an honor to talk to you, Winston. Thank you so much for saying that. Oh, you're welcome. It's an honor and a pleasure to be interviewed by you. I know that you have your own kudos as a natural bodybuilder. Right. Which I respect so much. I think it's great. Thank you. I have nothing against bodybuilders that use steroids. My view is that it's a personal choice. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, they're great no matter what. Um, My viewpoint on that is that um, bodybuilding is like any it's just like any other sport, you know? Yeah. Um, what I mean is, um, for instance, I have a good friend who you'll know his name, who won the hundred the hundred meter dash. His medal was taken away. You know who I mean, right? Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson. Right. I I didn't know Ben personally up until about two or three years ago when we were introduced. Okay. But I had also said to many people in, uh, discussing the topic that Ben Johnson and people like Ben Johnson and like Usain Bolt, these kinds of guys, they're naturally fast. Right. And I said, if you speak to Ben Johnson and ask him about his youth in the Caribbean, uh, he will tell you the same story, and what I mean is, I'm I'm originally from the Caribbean, mm-hmm. so I know I know the, um, the 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 social practices and so on. So, for instance, on a Sunday, our mothers would often ask us to go into the backyard and catch a chicken, <laughs> which she will cook, or a chicken or two that she'll cook for lunch that day. Mm-hmm. And I would bet you that in Ben Johnson's case, the chickens never had a chance. (laughs) You you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. As a a young man, he was naturally fat. Right. So when I did meet Ben and we were chit-chatting, I said, Ben, I have a question to ask you. And I told him that story. He said, he stammers a lot. Have you ever heard him speak? He says, uh-huh. he says, he says, says, Winston, you, you, you're absolutely right, you know. <laughs> he said that was that was the case indeed. So um, an interview with um, Mike Ashley, who was the top bodybuilder in the 1980s, and Mike's from Germany. Yeah. And uh, when I was, you know, watching him in the 1980s, I had about him being natural. But after doing the interview with him and seeing him when he was younger, and just seeing his natural and how lean he was and how muscular he was, I can yes. I can believe it, you know. Yes. Well, you see, so the point I was making really is that bodybuilders, um, champions in bodybuilding, like other sports, are naturally gifted. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, Phil Heath is called the gift. Right. And what, the reason, if you know why he was called the gift, is that God has given him more body parts that grow easily than anyone else in the game today. Mm -hmm. You know, and and everybody has weaknesses and everybody has a few strengths. Right. And and in his case, as people are saying, he's he's not as wide as he could be or you would like him to be. Mm Mm-hmm. But really, that may be his only downfall. So when you look at the other bodybuilders, and you look at what gifts they got, they're working with less marbles than he's working with. Yeah, yeah. And so the competition comes in, in that it's how each, each competitor learns his weaknesses and strengths in his physique, and by training learns how to develop them 
and bring them up to scratch uh, and bring up, bring bring all those muscles on the competitive field. Some have issues that you can't solve. For instance, a Dorian Yates, who was a great great champion, of course, a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. He had that wide waist, right? Right. But the thing is, he developed the rest of his body so well that you had to overlook it. And then, of course, it depends on how you pose and Mm -hmm. try to camouflage those weaknesses that you have and show the strengths that you have. Right. Now, I know uh, you asked me a question, and I'm going to go back to it so that your listeners could get the detail on Winston Roberts. So here, here's how it came. How I got into the game. Okay. Um, and I'm not. I'm going to try and make it short because it, it could be long, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> the, the long and short of it is that I came up from the Caribbean. Okay. Um, I, I, I had already been working out in the Caribbean and reading the magazines and all that stuff. And I was awarded a scholarship to go to study in Canada by the Canadian government. Okay. So I had a brother in Montreal who was going to university in Montreal. And um, so that summer, which was 1964, I came up in 1963 in September. Mm -hmm. But in 1964, the summer, I went to spend my summer with my brother in Montreal. And as luck would have it, it turned out that the the, the Weeder office, the head office, was a block away from my brother's house. Wow. And I had said to my mother when I was leaving the Caribbean, that day I was leaving, I said, I'm going to meet Ben Weeder. (laughs) And she said, okay, whatever. You know what I mean? (laughs) <laughs> but it turned out that that summer I got my when I found out a friend of mine said hey Winston there's some kind of weightlifting place around the corner you should go check it out because he knew I was into the weight training and um, so I went to I went and looked and I said oh my gosh I recognize the building right away because it used to be in all the magazines you'll see the building with the um, stylized figures uh-huh. on the side of the building and so on. And I said, oh, my gosh, it's the Weeder building. So I got dressed up the next day in my suit and tie and all that and went around. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I was I asked to meet Ben Weeder, and the secretary in, uh, said, okay. And Ben met with me, and we talked for about two and a half hours. Wow. And he said, you're far away from home. Consider me your friend. And you're welcome here anytime. And he gave me the run of the place. Hmm. I was able to go there on a regular basis, get all the latest magazines at least a month before they came on the stands. Yeah. And, and, you know, all that stuff. And one of the things he asked me to do, he says, okay, what are you doing at university? I said, history. So he said, he said, well, then, you must know a lot about constitutional matters. So I said, mm-hmm. fair amount. So he said, I'm going to commission you to write the constitution of the IFBB. Wow, no kidding. <clears throat> so I actually wrote the first constitution of the IFBB. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I never knew that. I wrote, I wrote the whole thing, and then I, I launched into writing the the judge's rule book. Mm-hmm. And I wrote most of the judge's rule book. And later on, when um, Oscar State came on board with us, you, you know who Oscar is, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Oscar State came from an organization called BALA, B-A-W-L-A, British Amateur Weightlifting Association. Mm-hmm. And he was a big wheel in the weightlifting uh, committee of the IOC, and Ben Wheeler brought him in because Ben felt that Oscar would be able to contribute to his bringing bodybuilding into the IOC and at a different level in 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 acceptance in sports, you know. Right. So and Oscar, so Oscar and I collaborated, and he he contributed some of his ideas, and we finished the 
the, the judge's rule book. And by the way, one of the things I claim is that I was the one that chose the compulsory poses that we use today. Really? Wow. That's amazing. And, and I will say that there was a gentleman from Czechoslovakia who also, he and I had worked on it. And and we came up with those the the original six compulsory poses that we still use today. Wow! And we and we've thrown in the most muscular because we wanted those poses. To, so because you see, here's the thing: a bodybuilder, you know, uh, the the first round of bodybuilding, the so-called relaxed round, mm-hmm. is supposed to uh, uh, have the, the bodybuilder stand in a sense naked in front of the judges. Right. In other words, you're not hiding any weaknesses and all that stuff. And so the judges are able to make a clear assessment of the athlete. And then the compulsory poses, again, which we consider to be the the best poses in bodybuilding that show the physique from head to toe would, again, maybe give the bodybuilder a chance to show some of his strength, but we will also be able to see the weaknesses. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, like a double bicep front, if a guy has great arms, you know, like Arnold had, for instance, was fantastic, as you would say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then if he had a wide waist, we also see it too. Yeah. And, it, and so on. And I, I could go through the uh, six poses and tell you why, you know. Like yeah, a lot of people, for instance, you know, I, get, I pick one, for instance, like the side tricep. Mm-hmm. I mean, I see Big Roly has probably the greatest tricep development today. Well, the thing is, we're not just looking at triceps. Yeah. We're looking at the bodybuilder from the head to the toe. Mm-hmm. So it, it, he may have great triceps, but he may have weak leg biceps. Yeah. So we see that too, and a lot of a lot of bodybuilding aficionados don't um, don't think of that when they when they're looking at the poses. They look at the guy's strong point, and then they they, they forget some of the weak points. Mm-hmm. See, like in the side tricep, you're also looking at the serrati magni, the intercostals. You're looking at the abs, you're looking at the pe- you're looking at the whole body, not just yeah. one body part. It's just a name that we chose, you know? Right. Because, you know, it's a side triceps, you know? And you another one, one is, is another one is side chest. Um if you go back and look closely at most of the Mr. Olympias where Frank Zane competed, mm-hmm. you'll see Frank Zane never did a side chest. And I was often the um, the the MC at, at many of the prejudgings of some of the Olympias. Mm-hmm. And um, anytime I got to side chest, I'd go side chest. <laughs> come on around, and Frank Zane, Frank Zane would be fumbling, fumbling, fumbling in his way, <laughs> and mm-hmm. he'd never really do the side chest. And and the point is, he's smart, you know. Yeah. You see, uh, like like Arnold once said to a friend of mine. Never show them your weakness. Never show them your weakness. You have to show them your strong point, you know, that type of thing, you know. So anyway, um, so I wrote the Constitution and helped develop the judges' booklet. And um, then I became secretary. I also wrote the Constitution of the Canadian Federation and the Quebec Federation. Hmm. And I placed myself as secretary of all those organizations, because I didn't want to be president. I didn't feel, com- I, I didn't want to be president. And part of the reason I didn't want to be president, I was still sort of a competing bodybuilder. Yeah. And so I didn't want people to say, well, if I went into a competition to say he won, of course, because he's the president, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So I, I stayed as secretary and basically pulled the strings of the president from behind the scenes huh. and and then worked closely with Ben on all matters. We traveled to over 50 countries, uh, expanding bodybuilding across the world, you know? Mm-hmm. 
And uh, again, I'm going to be brag a little bit here because the modern folks don't know. Mm -hmm. One of the other things I'm very, very proud of, not as not just as a bodybuilder, but as a human being, is that in 1973, we were having our annual general meeting in um, Geneva, in Geneva, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And we were approached by um, the South African delegation that they would like to host the 1975 World Championships there. Right. What, you know what we call, so we still call Mr. Universe, right? Yeah. And um, in those days, South Africa was banned from the, uh, from the Olympic Games because of their practice of apartheid. Mm -hmm. But Ben Weider had made a decision that politics has no business in sports. And so we continued to receive South African delegates and bodybuilders in our event. And at that time, each country was allowed three athletes and two delegates. Okay. And we did make a rule to say that South Africa had to bring at least one black delegate uh -huh. and one black bodybuilder. Okay. So when we came to make the decision of whether we would go to South Africa or not in 1975, then we just stopped the meeting. It was near to lunchtime. He said, well, I'm going to stop the meeting. He says, I'm going to ask Winston. I was the only black member of the executive committee. He says, I'm going to ask Winston to think about it over lunch. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, there will be one vote of whether we go or not, and it will be Winston's vote. Wow. So um, South Africa had brought a black delegate named Fred Tebede. Um, he was all, had also been one of their delegates to the Olympic Committee. I know he was an older man. And I said to Fred, I said, Fred, come to my room. We'll have lunch in my room. And I want you to tell me why we should um, go to South Africa. Now, the other two people from South Africa were, were Johan and Lolly Bester. Mm -hmm. They were the other representatives. But I said, obviously, they're white. So I said, I'm going to ask the black guy. I want to get yes. his point of view. Well, what I discovered was that South Africa had 450 gyms, and the Great Reg Park was an owner of several of them, or some of them anyway, maybe five or so. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, Fred Tabeda said to me, non black people are not allowed to be members of the gym. Mm. So I said, oh, okay. So he said, Winston, the white people, I'm going to copy his accent, <laughs> the white people of South Africa are very, very rich people. They can go anywhere in the world where they want to see anything that they want to see. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, enough. We're coming to South Africa. Mm. Wow. So, and I said, we're going to make a set of rules. So some of the rules that Ben and I put in place were, number one, all athletes must stay in the same five-star hotel regardless of color. Okay. Number two, all athletes from anywhere in the world were to get an automatic visa to go to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Num number three, South Africa must pay all passages of all athletes from all over the world. And they even paid Ben Weider's passage, and he didn't need his passage paid. He's so wealthy. But they paid his passage also. Number four, I said, South Africa must be allowed to field two teams, a white team and a black team. Mm -hmm. Because we wanted to give the black bodybuilders a chance to be exposed. Right. And what happened there was that the General Assembly took that, and I think they still run with it today. So the host country 
is always allowed to field an A team and a B team. Hmm. Okay. So those were some of the rules that we made about going to South Africa. And I'm very proud of that because that was done long before Nelson Mandela was released and so on. Yeah. And from then on, in fact, the, the next year, the head of the South African Bodybuilding Association was a, was a black man called Franz Kunu. Oh, okay. And the government funded him. They gave him $60,000 to, to run it, you know? Uh-huh. So we made a lot, of, a lot of progress with that, you know? It was the first time that South Africa saw on TV black and white people on the same stage shaking hands and being wow. together and so on. So wow. those were nice, nice things that, that we yeah, did, that's... you know? One of the things I'm proud of that we did. So before, before the IFBB came into South Africa, would you be allowed to compete in the shows? Oh, yes, they were allowed to compete. They, they competed, but their bodybuilders were not very strong. Mm-hmm. So they didn't do as well. Yeah. But after that point, they actually got better. I don't remember some of the names now, but both white and black bodybuilders out of South Africa and right after the next five years after that acquitted themselves very, very well in, in our World Championship and Mr. Universe competitions. Yeah. And they, they have produced a few, a few good bodybuilders. Uh, yeah, they've done well. So I want to give you a quick story about that. Okay. I have many stories that people who know me, Gary Bartlett, would have told you. Uh, so in South Africa, it's extremely hot. Hmm. So when do you think most people go to the gym in South Africa? Like, for instance, here in North America, mm-hmm. the gym packed when? Usually in the afternoon, after work. In the late, late afternoon, four to, four to eight, let's say, right? Right. right. In South Africa, the gyms are packed between 5 and 8 in the morning. Okay. So um, my friend and I, a guy named Sid, Sid Pocalo, who I had made, um, well, we set him up as president of Canada. We went to the gym to work out uh-huh. at 5 o'clock or what in the morning. So I, I, so I did some, some bench presses, you know? Uh-huh. So they had some black fellows. Actually, the gyms had black people, black guys working in the gym. So when I put the weight down, the black fellows came over and took the weight and put it away. So my friend Sid Pucalo said, no, 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 no. He says, we'll put our own weights away. Right. I said to Sid, I said, Sid, when in Rome, <laughs> do as the Romans do. <laughs> Leave them alone. This is their job. Yeah. Let, put, let them put the weights away. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. But yeah. the black fellows used to go to some gyms. They sort of were like YMCA's. Uh-huh. And they called them boys, boys clubs. Boys clubs. Uh-huh. So I went and visited a couple of them, and they had a few weights scattered around, and they would work out. It's quite amazing the physiques that they developed with very limited limited equipment, you know. But as I said later on, that changed. That gives you an idea. And I remain the Secretary General of the IFBB Mm -hmm. from um, 1969. Actually, I became the official secretary in 1972. Okay. When we went to Baghdad, we went to Baghdad, Iraq. Right. We did our the book over there, yeah. world championships there, mm-hmm. and I was competing. Oh, really? Hmm. I was officially the assistant general secretary. Alex Karali from Egypt was the secretary, but he didn't, he couldn't make it, so I was the acting general secretary, and I was competing at the same time, and I came sixth in the tall class. Wow. My cats won that class. And My cats, yeah. A couple of others. Um, and I, I was sixth place. And I, I was, wow. was satisfied with that. I did all right, you know? Yeah, I didn't, I, was, I didn't know you were competing, in fact, then, in those shows. Well, I, I was Mr. Canada in 19, um, 
1964 and 1972. Okay. So I wow, that's the great. At that time. Hey, Winston, I wanted to ask you about the uh, judging. You mentioned you, you guys put together the judge's handbook. And I've gotten into conversations with people on this show because we talked about how bodybuilding used to be compared to how it is today. And it yeah. seemed like back then in the 70s, it, especially in the 70s, there was more of an emphasis on symmetry and proportion and the flow of the physique, the shape of the physique and the beauty of the physique. And I think today we've seen in a lot of pro shows where size is really being rewarded and also hardness. I've seen that with especially a lot of local judges who may not have the experience or the knowledge, hardness over everything else. You know, the, 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 the more ripped the guy can get over qualities as symmetry and proportion and we know how long it takes to develop a really proportionate physique or to have a very symmetrical, beautiful physique. A lot of the judges today don't have that knowledge that you had back then. You see, here's, here's the thing. If you were to go back to the original booklet that we put together, mm -hmm. there, were three, there are three aspects that we look at. Right. And, and when I see a lot of the comments online and so on about about shows and how who should have won they sat near the big Rami and whatnot. Yeah. People don't know, like you say, they don't know and they forget that there are three categories that we look at in a physique. Mm -hmm. And the three categories, the first one is symmetry. Right. That's for, that's that's first. In other words, we're talking about balance between the upper body and lower body, and then balance between like your legs and calves and your biceps versus mm -hmm. shoulders, blah, 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 right? The second criterion is muscularity. Now, what muscularity means is you have to have, and the word is enough muscle vis-a-vis -vis your bone structure. Hmm, okay. So I remember, I'm particularly small-boned, yeah. although I'm a tall guy. And I remember paying attention to many champions back in the day and as we go ahead. When they did their measurements of their wrists, some guys had as much as 8-inch wrists. Mm -hmm. I think there were even a couple of 9-inch wrists. These guys have massive bones. In my case, for instance, I had like, seven inch wrist or something like that. Uh -huh. And so when we talk about enough muscle, so for instance, why did Frank Zane win so many Mr. Olympias? Because he's small boned, but his muscle size versus his, his tiny knees, for instance, mm -hmm. gave him such aesthetics and he looked just as big as anyone else. Right. See what I'm saying? So, when you say size, you say muscularity, size, we're talking size of muscle versus bone structure. So a small man like Frank Zane would get the same recognition as a big guy, like, you know, Mike Menser or Robbie Robinson or somebody else. Right. So it, it, and then, so we say muscularity. And then the third criterion is definition. Mm -hmm. Now, we, it means, definition means we need to see the detail of the muscle. So, as we say today, you can get ripped. So, you might have somebody who comes in as the most ripped bodybuilder. What was the name of that guy from the Middle East? Abdulli Abdullah, remember him? Mm. Or a guy like um, Munsa, remember Munsa, Andreas Munsa? Yeah. I mean, this guy was the most ripped. Yeah. But but he didn't have the other criteria that we're looking for. He didn't have the symmetry, at. right. Mm -hmm. And so people look at one aspect of the physique and say, wow, that's yeah. amazing. It's fantastic. Then what about the rest of it? You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So, and so they have to know that that's the interpretation that the judges are looking at when we go in. So, like, I remember one time I went to to observe an, uh, an NPC, uh, Mr. America. And at that show, um, 
Sean Ray had won his class, but he didn't win the overall. I forget who won the overall. I think it was a guy from Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was talking to some people, some of the judges and so on, and somebody said to me, well, you know what? We had our mass judges here today. <laughs> and, you know, like, um, there's no such thing as mass judges or, exactly. or rip judges or, you know what I mean? Right. You got to look at the physique all the time, even in, even in, when it comes to free posing. I'm I'm a big proponent of the free posing round, and and I mm -hmm. I, I see that we brought it back now into contention, and that the at the amateur levels here in Canada and in the IFBB they don't count the free posing round at all. Right. I think that's wrong. I think it's, like Arnold said, it's important because yeah. now in pre-posing around, the bodybuilder gets the chance to hide those weaknesses, to show his physique in the best light. And, you know, by the same token, you may be Rudolf Nureyev and you can really move on stage and all that stuff. Doesn't mean you should win the show because you were the best poser, like, like an Ed Corny, yeah. who brought down the house many times. Mm -hmm. But if the physique is not there, then he, he still has, you're, you're still looking at those three aspects of the physique. They yeah. forget that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At like local oh, shows no. out here, and they'll put someone who's missing body parts, like where they're missing even arms. And the guys even might have like the stomach sticking out, the distended stomach. And he'll exactly. beat someone of better V taper who has proportionate legs, proportionate arms better muscle mass overall, just a better proportionate physique. Maybe he isn't quite as hard as the other guy. You know, they're judging is just one aspect of the physique, which is hardness, you know, and it's just, they're missing exactly. the bulk on what real bodybuilding is. Not one aspect. Right. When, when, I, when I first came to, to Montreal, I now live in Toronto, but I lived in Montreal for 30 years, so I, I, I stayed there because one of the requirements of being the Secretary General, you had to live beside the President, you know? Mm -hmm. which is Ben Weaver. So I, I stayed there, but I stayed there because of family and all that stuff too. But however, when I first went to Quebec and I competed myself and I, I looked, they, they, they used to award a most muscular physique. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy that won the most muscular physique was always the guy in the best condition. Yeah, the most ripped. And then they would award the, the title to some guy who was smooth but did have he did have nice balance. He did have nice yeah. symmetry. Right, right. The two things were never put together until we wrote the rules and changed all that, you know? Yeah. So therefore, you know, there's no such thing as, as size judges or rim mm -hmm. judges or symmetry judges or whatever. The judges are asked to sit there and consider those aspects all the time. Look, yeah. judges are human beings too, John, eh? Mm -hmm. Which means humans humans make errors. Yeah. So they'll make mistakes, and so that's okay. That's why we have 7, 9, 11, 15, whatever judges we have. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the biases are ruled out, and the results that you come out with is what's left in the wash, because a guy might like a Frank Zinn-type physique as opposed to a branch warren type physique mm -hmm. and so he might show his bias in his results and so if he votes frank zane first then that may be struck out and another judge who votes branch warren first that'll be struck out yeah and then if somebody hates frank zane say ah the guy's too small and votes him down then that low score will be struck out and if another guy hates Branch Warren because he doesn't have the symmetry, then that score will be struck out. Yeah. So you come out with a wash of what the the other judges um, gave that the athletes, you know? Mm -hmm. People don't take that into consideration. It takes a lot of training and intelligence to be a good judge because you have to look at all those yeah. aspects of the physique. You and know, you really have to know what you're looking at hard not to be biased because everybody has a favorite physique that they like. Yeah. And then the other, the other thing is to 
who were the last guys on the cover of the magazines. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that, and then if, if the last guy was on the cover of the magazine comes into the show, he's going to get a little bit more consideration. Mm-hmm. Because his physique is more in the head of the the judges and the crowd and so on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So all those things you have to take into consideration. And and hopefully the system of of elimination of highs and low scores will um bring about an uh an even result, you know, that would be as close to correct as possible. Yeah, you almost wonder if it'd be beneficial to have a judging clinic before people can be judges where they'd have to go through Well well classes, you should. You know. and that's why and that's why, you know, a lot of judges um, go through um, the amateur ranks of judging, mm-hmm. and the job of people like Jim Mannion and others is to have observed those judges in, as they judge in the amateur division, and then you speak to them and correct them, and then they learn as they come up the ranks before they can judge a huge international show of any type, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where the the training is supposed to take place at the amateur level. You can't just fly somebody in. I'll give you an example. In 1982, this is how humans can make errors. Okay. In 1982, Mr. Olympia, where? Do you remember, John? London, right? London. So here we were in the in the famous um, Wimbledon, right? Yeah. Judging the Mr. Olympia. And um, you remember the array of the athletes. I don't want bothers to name them, but you know who they were. Roger Walker, Chris Dickerson, Frank Zane, Samir, mm-hmm. all the gang, you know? Yeah, Casey Vidor. Mm-hmm. But I want to tell you, if you look at the judges' scores, for instance, if you look at my score at that event, in the, in the pre-judging, I scored Frank Zane ninth place. Wow. Okay. And then when we came to the evening show, they brought out the top six. Mm-hmm. And there was Frank Zane. Yeah. I said, shit, Frank Zane. <laughs> um, I mean, and I love Frank. He and I are great buddies, you know? Mm-hmm. I said, well, if he's in top six, then for me, he's got to be sixth. Right. So I put him sixth. Mm-hmm. And it, as, it turned out that he placed, I think it was second. Second, yeah. Now, here's the deal. Do you know who were responsible for Frank Zane placing so high? No. The European judges. Mm. Because it was the first time that the European judges were seeing Frank Zane in person. Okay. And Frank Zane is an impressive bodybuilder. He poses with great panache. I mean, he's one of the best poses. You know that. Yeah. So they were so impressed that they kept him up there. And his reputation, too, I'm sure. And reputation, of course. Of course. Yeah. Three times. That's what I say about human error. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Frank Zane, I got in touch with Frank Zane in the middle of the summer the next year because um, some people were asking for him to guest pose. And they asked me if I would contact him and ask him. So I was speaking to him on the phone. And he said to me, he says, Winston, I want to tell you something. So I said, okay, Frank, what do you want to say? He says, you were the only one of the judges that realized that I was not in shape. Yeah. And if you go back and look at those pictures carefully, he had skin all over his abs. Yeah. And fat on his abs. He wasn't. He wasn't in good shape. Yeah, I think that was the first show he came in at 200 pounds. I think he tried to come in bigger. Exactly. And I remember, I remember watching the video of that, and when I saw him posing, you could see the definition wasn't there like it normally was. Exactly. So, but you see, I mean, I never had any problems with those guys. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of judges sometimes would tell the athletes, "I had you first. I don't know what happened." You know. Yeah. And then we never used to show the scores, right? Right. And um, 
But I was always straightforward with the guys. I would say I had you sixth or fifth right. or whatever. So here's where I had you and here's what I think happened. So the yeah. guys always used to like to talk to me to ask me what they what did they do wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. Like for instance, I remember um, it was about 1980. I was I was in um, Virginia, and Samir Benut was a guest poser at a show there. I was asked to go down and and oversee a show down in uh, Virginia, and um, Samir was the guest poser. And we had a chat, you know. Mm-hmm. And I said to Samir, I said, Samir, right now you are the best bodybuilder in the world but you have never put it together. Mm -hmm. And I said, the day you decide. What year was this one, sir? That was like 1980 or something like that. Oh, 80, okay, yeah. I said, the day you decide to put it all together, no one will beat you. Right. Because he had such great symmetry, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah. But he needed to bring in all the muscle size and the definition Mm-hmm. It had to all come together, and of course, it all came together in 1983 right. in the Olympia there, and I wasn't surprised that he won. That show, many people thought that Berto Fox should have won. Right. But if you go back and look at Berto Fox's routine, he never showed his back once. Right. Yeah, he's a very clumsy poser. So, you know, um, it's, I mean, the great size and all that. But, you know, you, you've you got to have all the marbles ticking, you know? Yeah, I preferred the way that they did the judging back then because they would reward physiques like Samir or Frank Zane or Muhammad McAway, you know, guys who didn't have the size, but they were just put together so well with the symmetry and the, and the posing, like you said, and they had all aspects of the physique. Well, there were no big stomachs back then, that's for sure. No, mm-mm. They, I think the IFBB... Jim Mannion in particular is going to have to look at that because we looked at it a a few years back and the guts went down, but they seem to have been up again this year. So Jim Mannion is going to have to pay some attention to that and send out a missive to let the guys know that that if you come in with big guts, you're going to be automatically voted down. Right. Because the guys can do without that. They can. They really can. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, since we're talking about judging, let's talk about that 81 Mr. Olympia, Winston, because that's the one that, uh, what the show is all about. And yeah, uh, you, were one of the, you were one of the judges there. We had uh, Roger Schwab on a couple of weeks ago. He was the head judge. I, but did, he just... I did hear that, actually. I, oh, I you did? Okay. Roger was a good friend of mine. He's a very stoic uh, gentleman. Mm-hmm. Sort of a no nonsense guy, you know. Yeah, yeah. So tell me your thoughts on uh, those competitors when they came out. What What did you feel? You know, the top guys: Franco, Chris Dickerson, uh, Tom Platts, Roy Callender, Danny. Well, you see, I'll tell you the truth. At many Olympias that I have judged, and I've I've probably judged. In fact, I'm sure that I have judged more Olympias than anyone else. No one else has judged as many Olympias as I have. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you my, I wouldn't call it maybe a disappointment because I love the sport. But one of the um, things that always I was a little unhappy about when I went to judge these Olympias is for some reason you'd see the guys come out and I'd go, what the heck? <laughs> guys, so many guys are not in shape. Yeah. What happened? You know. Right. What That's happened? The big show. You know, like like you go back to to the days of Robbie Robinson, Mike Manson. Or, you know, yeah. Guys come out, and I go. I always I loved Robbie, and I said Robbie's going to take the Olympia this year, this year, next year, and so on. <laughs> right. You see him come out, and he. He'd have all the size and the peak biceps and all that. Yeah. But he's not sharp. And you go, oh, my God. You know, I was expecting right. to see him at his best. Yeah. Or Mike Mensah. 
or, or any of the other guys, you know, mm-hmm. you go, what the hell happened here? You know, <laughs> right. So you'd end up with, you, you'd end up, you'd end up with, with, with three or four guys. You say, These guys are the top, you know? Yeah. But I'll give you a feeling that I have when I see the lineups come out. And it was the same for this show. Okay. The guys come out. And to be honest with you, as a judge, I'm really nervous because these guys are the best bodybuilders in the world. Right. And so people don't even realize the magnitude of what you're seeing. Yeah. You're seeing the best bodybuilders in the world. These are the best. They're Mr. Spain's, Mr. Universes. They're they're the top, right? Right. And they all come out. And my fear as a judge is that I'm not going to be able to tell who's best. That they're all so good in their own way. Mm -hmm. And so it takes about five minutes Mm -hmm. when they first come out and they're lined up in front of you, Mm -hmm. looking at them, looking at them, looking at them. And then, John, what happens to me is that all of a sudden, it's like, bing, this guy stands out. Bing, the next guy stands out. Bing, they start jumping out at you. Boom, boom, boom. So you might come out with three or four guys who are definitely in contention for the title, and then another two or three guys who are going to make up the top six, top seven. Okay. And then I settle down, and now you start judging. Right. <laughs> you see, now you can see what the hell's going on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You're over the Occasion- initial excitement. Occasionally, occasionally, we had one guy that was like unbelievable. Like, for instance, you remember the years. I don't, I don't remember the years as well. But the year that Ronnie Coleman came in at 296. What year was that, John? I think that was uh, 2003. Something like that. 2003, 2004, yeah. When Ronnie walked out in the pre-judging, and this was at the Mandalay Bay with all that stuff going on this last week. Yeah, yeah. At the Mandalay Bay Convention Center, and Ronnie worked walked out in the prejudging. There were six thousand people in the in the arena, mm-hmm. and you heard six thousand people gasp. I don't know if you ever heard that sound. <laughs> wow. I mean, you go, "What the hell?" Right. <laughs> what is this? The guy walks out. It's like his muscles look like they were going to bounce off his thighs and bounce on the floor and right, right. bounce away and hurt somebody or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, forget about it. Now we're looking at second place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So occasionally that happened, and, and it happened too with Dorian Yates and in, in, in several of his shows. Mm-hmm. When, when, when Dorian Yates went from the old style of training to the new style of training, we were in Atlanta, Georgia, so that was in the 1993s or whatever yeah, that those years right. were. Mm-hmm. And I remember going to New York City that summer to see a show. Bevan, Bevan, um, Steve put on whatever show it was. They were, they put on Mr. New York City or whatever, and uh-huh. he was the guest poser. Right. And he came on stage to guest pose that night. And I think he weighed in at something like 280. Yeah. Because I had seen him signing autographs during the day, you know. And he had loose clothes on. I said, gee, Dorian looks fat. Yeah. (laughs) But when he walked out on stage to guest pose, it was like, holy shit, what happened? (laughs) Right. So I remember Wayne DeMille came running down to me and he said, Winston, You've seen more people than anybody else. Mm-hmm. What do you think of Dorian? I said, oh, my God. <laughs> Everybody's going to take a back seat. Yeah. <laughs> to this guy in the come Olympia time. Right. But what people don't remember is that Dorian had won the Olympia riding around. Before that, he won riding around 235, just yeah. under 240. 
Right. And then in this next year, all of a sudden, with the new style of training that he credited, I think, to Mike Mensah and so on, mm -hmm. right. he came in at something like 264 on stage. I mean, forget it. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't beat the guy, you know, the guy. Now let me ask you about that, uh, Winston, because you've seen, you go all the way back, you've seen Arnold at his best, you've seen uh, Frank Zane, and we were talking about how all aspects of the physique are so important, the symmetry, the muscle mass compared to your bone structure, you know, the, and then the ability to present it with your posing. So when you yeah. see someone like a Ronnie Coleman or uh, Dorian Yates, who is, you know, now they've redefined what the sport is, because it was never like that before, because they've got so much muscle mass. Do you think, yeah. you know, because I know some of the old school people think that that's too much size for, a, a you know, the way an ideal physique should look like? Look, there's no such thing as too much size. Bodybuilding is about size. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's face it. Your bodybuilding is about size. But it's also about symmetry. So these guys, like Dorian Yates in his, in his, in his best years, had great symmetry. Okay. And, and... It's only after they begin to lose that symmetry, like Dorian Yates had ripped biceps and ripped yeah. uh, leg muscles and so on. And then he began to lose that symmetry, but he was still so high in quality, the other guys couldn't match up. Yeah. You know, I remember um, at one of those uh, Mr. Olympias in, 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 um, in, in Atlanta, um, Big Louie competed. Do you remember that? Yeah, 93, yeah. Big, Big Louie came in, and Big Louie was something like 320. Yeah. But it's it's just size. Mm -hmm. Where was the symmetry? Where are the lats? And then he had stuff in his calves. And Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's this, this is not what we're looking for. It just isn't. Right, right. So, so size is okay. But you've got to be careful that you bring the symmetry along with it. And that's the mistake. The, the way I see is that a lot of guys that are training now, they're going in the gym and they're lifting heavy, heavy weights and heavy, mm -hmm. heavy weights. And they're eating tons of food and they're taking all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. to make them big and so on. But they're not paying attention. I've seen them train. And I know they're not training with symmetry in mind. Right. This is the problem. It's the, the training is wrong. Yeah. You know, you can bench, you know, you can bench uh, 150 pound dumbbells and squat with, with five, six plates and eight plates and whatnot. Right. But, you know, if your waist is getting big, your stomach is sticking out. And, yeah. And... and you know, your biceps are growing, but your triceps are not growing. Right. Then you're not paying attention. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. You're not paying attention. This is a lot of these guys. I often said, I wish that the IFBB would have hired, and I'm going to say it because people won't, somebody like me mm -hmm. to be hired to come to an Olympia, say a week before the Olympia. And say, get all the guys on stage. Mm -hmm. Mark out all the spots, you know, have them go through their routines, how they do their routines best. Then you say, no, don't do this pose. Do that pose. And yeah. if you're doing this pose, do it like that. Do it like this and have the camera follow them. And do Because what I notice is that the guys don't even know what they look like. <laughs> right. They have no idea what they look like. They don't even know which poses they look best in. Yeah. And, and I'll I give you an example of that. Or, or, or the person who did it best, it was 1982, Chris Dickerson in England. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not a big guy, you know that. Right. But the thing is, when he posed, he displayed all the best aspects of his physique. Inner yeah. triceps, he posed to show the inner triceps. He posed to show his leg biceps that were always magnificent, and mm -hmm. so on and so on. That's a guy who knows what his physique looks like. Right. But the guy that comes out, does a double bicep, a lat spread, a most, a most muscular, and then puts his hand to his ear, like, come <laughs> on, guys, keep chair for me now, you know? Right, right. 
not, that's not, they don't know their physiques. Right. That's a great point when you said about training with symmetry in mind, because I remember, I remember reading Frank Zane's articles in the magazines back in the seventies. And he always trained with symmetry in mind. He knew exactly the kind of physique he wanted to develop. You're supposed to do that. Right. You're supposed to do that. I mean, and that's why I said, you know, you have to know what gifts you have. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're, like, for instance, uh, Big Roly. Obviously, Big Roly's arms overpower him. And in many of his, probably when he does back, his his biceps are so strong that the back muscles are not really getting the yeah. work they're supposed to get. So he right. doesn't have that spectacular back. Right, right. Well, you you heard the phrase, bodybuilding shows are often won from the back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you can you can walk out from the front, you look fantastic, you look amazing, and then you turn around the back, and it's like, oh. Yeah. What happened? Where did right. he, where did he go? Where where is he? Where did he right. go now? Right. The guy disappears, you know. Yeah, exactly. A guy that I I trained and advised for a bit was Paul Delette. Mm-hmm. Paul Delette had some of the best genetics the the world has ever seen. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I had a gym in Montreal called Winston's Fitness Center, and that's where he came. And he walked into the gym one day, and he was 175, six wow. foot one, 175 pounds. And I took a look at him, and I thought, son of a bitch. <laughs> this is the guy that has it. Yeah. <laughs> I looked at him, and I could see the physique. Do you know that Paul, in a year from that day, gained 80 pounds of muscle people wouldn't believe it unbelievable he went from 175 to 255 in a year unbelievable genetics huh and that was and he had no money because he was from a poor family Mm -hmm. all he used to eat was barbecue chicken and 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 um those potato wedges and a coke (laughs) wow and he just he had no steroids Really? Unbelievable. He grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And then I had a problem with my gym. I had some people that were stealing money, so I had to shut the gym down for three months. And then he went to another gym, and and there at that gym, he um, he started taking steroids. Mm. But I never got a chance to teach him how to pose. Yeah. I taught all my people how to pose, and I never got a chance to teach him how to pose because. He he uh, he went into the Montreal Championships that year, and he came third as a junior. He was 19. He should have been second, but he came third. Mm-hmm. And then, so we were preparing now for the next year, and I got a call from um, Vancouver, well, Victoria, B.C., British Columbia, from a guy named Warren Langman, who was running a North American championship. He says, Winston, I don't have a lot of entries. He says, I know you got a lot of guys training in your gym. He says, um, I'll pay for them to come out. Hmm. So he paid for 15 of us to fly out there. We had about two weeks to train. Hmm. And Paul went out, and he came third in the in the tall class, because back then it was by height. Yeah. And that was his qualification, which he used later on to go into the North Americas in, in L.A. Uh-huh. And then so um, I brought him out to California in 1991, set him up with Joe Weeder, but I never got a chance to teach him how to pose. And that was always his weakness. Yeah, And his back, his back was his weakness. Whenever right. he turned around, you go, where the hell did he go? What happened? Yeah, when you when you were talking about Raleigh, I was thinking of Paul Delette when you mentioned Raleigh. Exactly. So anyway, I know you want to talk about the 1991 Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Well, here, here's the thing. So these guys came out. Okay. Look, you want to be objective. Mm-hmm. I think there's there's a lot of um, um, hysteria. Uh, and um, a lot of favoritism that a lot of the people writing about it and talking about it online and so on. 
Yeah, still one of the most Some controversial of them weren't shows. There. Now, now, you said you were there. Right. You were a young bodybuilder, so I don't know how right. acute your senses were at the time. <laughs> but the thing is, to be honest with you, here's how I saw it. Okay. Franco, probably the hardest bodybuilder in the show. Okay. Now, okay, he didn't have the detail in the legs that a Chris Dickerson had, for instance. Mm -hmm. But he was in very, very good condition. Yeah, I agree. So, so obviously, he was going to be considered. And he had that trademark cut that went right across his chest. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So that that was a very attractive feature. He had great arms, great deltoids. Yeah. His back went, when he turned his back, his his back went right down into his waist. Right. He had a lot of great features that made him look fantastic. His abs were in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. He was definitely top three right off the bat. Okay. See, because when I'm judging and the guys come out, I put an asterisk beside their name. Okay. And I go, okay. I go, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. And then, so I maybe try to get top three. And then I, I put a check mark for guys that are lower. So I might have three asterisks and then three check marks. Okay. And a guy that in the, in the other three that looks pretty good might get a double check mark. So I say, I got to consider him in the top three. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing my comparisons, I got to bring him in. And okay. gotta take a look and see what he looks like, because a bodybuilder by himself looks fantastic until you put him next to somebody else, and then you go, "Oh, okay, right." He's not running, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so Franco was definitely in the top three. Um, Tom Platz, of course, Tom Platz came in with great fanfare mm -hmm. because his amazing legs. My opinion, no symmetry. Okay. You can't come into a show where your legs are so huge that your upper body doesn't match up. So the great feature on his physique, which was so attractive, technically becomes a weakness. Hmm. Okay. Because it throws the symmetry right off. And I Pretty remember, broke. and I I remember in my head when 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 he turned when he went on his knees to do a few poses, side chest and so on, these humongous leg biceps were hanging down. They look like growth. They look like, I go, what the heck? <laughs> you know, you can't tell someone this is the greatest physique in the world. Mm -hmm. it, his arms were okay. And mm -hmm. it, at that time, he hadn't got, he hadn't, suffered the rip that he eventually suffered in his right bicep. Yeah, that and was the next year. once that happened, he was, he was finished. Yeah. But the thing is, the legs were just... I mean, it's okay to have those great legs, but the upper body has to match it. Yeah. Has to match it. And they, they didn't. His calves think, were good. His calves were okay. Did you think he, he I mean, improved his upper body from previous showing? Oh yeah, no, no, no. I mean, he was close. Yeah. I mean, face it. He was. He was obviously top one of the top three guys we're looking at. Okay. Now you look at the guy like Danny Padilla. Danny Padilla again was one of those guys you would be hoping for. I knew Danny very well, and I hope Danny comes in. He's full and he's, you know, great yeah. symmetry. I hope he comes in ready. Got everything. Yeah. And then he was a little off. If you look at a double bicep of Danny and a double bicep of of of, of, of Chris Dickerson, a double bicep of the other guy, when he brings up his arms, he gets washed out. Hmm. And then on top of that, his trunks didn't fit. You go, you're coming into the Mr. Olympia, man. You know, that's one of the things about Frank Zane. You knew that in those early years, Frank Zane had his trunks made to measure yeah. by his design. You're coming in. you got to prepare in every which way. Right, right. 
you got to come in. You can't come in with with your trunks hanging off your body, and you know it just it takes away from that finish. Did you think Danny was just too lean? Maybe too, he took it too far. Yeah, he didn't bring that size that we know that he can bring. Okay. And then he wasn't, he didn't have that final sharpness that we know that he can bring. Hmm, okay. Still one of the top guys. Still one, of, I would have loved to give it to Danny. I'd love to give it to Danny. Uh-huh. I really love that, you know? And then again, it's that small man thing. I mean, uh, you know? Yeah. Bodybuilding is about big guys, you know what I mean? Right, right. And my friend, my great friend, Roy Callender. Yeah. Roy was in good shape. And he posed really well. Mm hmm But you know that Roy has bow legs, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. See? And people don't think of those things, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Are you going to take, I mean, not that that was the reason why he didn't do better, but is a guy with bow legs the best? body in the world you see these are things you have to think about okay you know and i know that he wasn't as sharp as he was a few days before and you can't really use that either because you're not judging him against himself like a few days before Mm -hmm. but between you and i he was caught eating a bunch of donuts midnight the night before (laughs) really wow because Jimmy Caruso was his trainer. <laughs> right. And, and Jimmy caught him in the hallway with a bunch of, do- with a bunch of donuts. Oh, no. <laughs> and we know that he wasn't as sharp as he could have been. But he oh, was wow. sharp. He was good. Yeah. He was, I mean, let's face it, he was one of the. I mean, you know, people don't realize that these are the best guys in the world. Right. Best of the best. You can't say... Ah, somebody effed up, you know, he should have mm-hmm. won. I mean, years after Roy, we used to wear a T-shirt that said, the unofficial Mr. Olympia. Right. <laughs> and and that's great stuff, because these are the best bodies in the world. Roy was amazing. He was he was definitely fantastic, and he posed to, to classical music, which Jimmy Caruso put together. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy is the greatest posing teacher in the world. Yeah. You should get a hold of Jimmy Caruso. Yeah, I'd love to talk to him. Jimmy Caruso, uh, by my standards, was the best photographer in physique the world has ever seen. Yeah, that's what Roy said, too. And, and by the way, the best trainer wow. the world has ever seen. Nobody knows how to train someone like Jimmy Caruso. Yeah. Jimmy Caruso trained a young lad about three years ago took him off the streets of Montreal from doing cocaine and all that stuff. The uh-huh. guy had no physique potential and built the guy in two years to physique that seemed to be going in the direction of what Arnold looked like. Wow, really? I hired the guy, never stepped on stage. He was like 20 years old. Uh-huh. I hired him to guest pose at a show of mine. What a routine he put down that Jimmy put together. It was beautiful. But Jimmy trained this guy, brought him from nothing to a near-perfect physique. And then, unfortunately, the guy didn't realize what he had. Mm -hmm. And he left Jimmy to go and train with some other people. He started taking steroids and that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he went into a show in Quebec, and he came eighth. And that was the end of that. Wow, what a shame. But Jimmy Caruso is, you know... By the way, when Arnold won in 1980 mm-hmm. in South Africa, the only person who knew he was going to compete, but probably one of two people, was Jimmy Caruso and probably Joe Weider. Mm, really? Because Arnold flew Jimmy down to California uh-huh. to take his pictures. Oh, yeah, I remember those pictures. Yeah, the, I, have, I remember the studio shots that he took. Yeah, he took he took those pictures. Right. Of Arnold. And he told our, he told Jimmy, you got to keep it quiet. I'm not hmm. allowed to tell it. But Jimmy told me, so I knew he was going. <laughs> right. 
But Jimmy is, you know, he's, I can't sing, over sing his phrases. He's fantastic. Yeah, I would love to talk to him one day. He's a true legend. Now, to get down to the, to the, to the, how the show came out. We did talk about uh, Chris Dickerson, though. What did you think about him? Chris Dickerson? Okay, I as, was one that voted Chris Dickerson first. Yeah, I saw that. He had great symmetry, the narrow waist, the wide lats, the wide shoulders. A weakness that Chris has, of course, is the arms. Mm-hmm. But then Franco's arms were not so fantastic either, were they? No. I think the best arms in the show would have been Roy Callender's arms. Yeah. Very hard to beat. So you can't fault the guy. His arms were, they were okay. Like I said, good enough. Good enough for the bone structure and so on. Mm -hmm. And he had the abs and the nice calves and he looked good. He maybe could have been a little tighter. Mm -hmm. Um... Why did I put him above Franco? Actually, I actually had Franco in third place. Okay. And in second place, I had I had Platzi. Did I? Wait a minute. Sorry. Well, I'm looking at the, no. the score sheets, and they, these are going by the rounds. And in round one, you had Danny and uh, Chris Dickerson with 20s, and then you gave Tom Platts, Roy Callender, and Franco in 19. Okay. So... I had Chris Dickerson in the 20s. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and Danny. Let me put it this way. You know what the the elephant in the room is? What? It's the judging system. Yeah, me and Roger talked about that. That was the last year. In fact, we only used that judging system for a couple of years, and we realized it was flawed. Yeah. And I'll tell you what the flaw was. A judge was allowed to give his first place winner 20. Yeah. Now, 20 didn't mean the guy is perfect. It meant he is the guy you think is the best on stage. Mm Mm-hmm. And then what we allowed, which was a mistake, because some other people got involved in the decision-making, like, Dennis Stallard of um, Ireland, Scotland, or something, and Oscar, and some others, and they allowed they, they allowed the judge. You could give as many twenty twenty scores as you want, mm-hmm. and so this was an out for the judges. For some of the judges, they yeah. said, I can't decide who's better, you know. Is it is it Danny or Franco or whoever? So I'm going to give them three twenties. Yeah. Now that's the judge that's copping out. Right. You can't make it means you can't make a decision. Mm-hmm. So we had judges ended up giving two two bodybuilders twenties, which means you're leaving the decision to the other judges. Yeah. You see. Right, and right. So, so with that kind of score, um, you know, like a Frank, I don't, re- I don't have the detail of how Franco Fassi scored the other athletes, but Franco Fassi, okay, he's obviously a friend of um, Franco. Yeah, he just had Franco with the twenty. He didn't give anybody else a twenty. The, he's Italian, right? Mm-hmm. He maybe was not so much a friend of Franco Colombo as the fact that they were both Italian. Right. <laughs> and that, and so the thing is, um, Franco Colombo was in good shape. Mm-hmm. And um, being, in, being in good shape, you can say he was okay, justified. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm giving him a 20. Um, Danny Padilla had took himself, he took himself out of contention by not being professionally prepared. Mm-hmm. He was not professionally prepared. One of the things that, that Frank Zane won on several shows, Frank Zane came in, he was perfectly tanned from head to toe. You know, Frank yeah. Zane was perfectly prepared. 
when Arnold came on stage, he was always perfectly prepared. Mm -hmm. You've got to be perfectly prepared. And if you're not, then you don't look. Those lights are harsh. Yeah. And they will kill you if you're not perfectly prepared. But you still gave Danny a 20 in the first round, right? Yeah, well, you know, because let's face it, first There's round symmetry. is symmetry. And, and that's what you have to remember. First round is symmetry. Yeah. And if the guy has perfect symmetry, he's got perfect symmetry. Right. Not have perfect muscularity. Mm -hmm. If you have perfect symmetry, he's supposed to get a 20 in round one. That's what round one was for. So he's, he's supposed to get a 20. In, in symmetry. And then round two with the muscularity, you gave Roy a 20. Roy and Roy and Chris Dickerson. So Roy had that massive size. Yeah. And he had that ruggedness. He was, he was cut to shred. He could have been sharper, but he was pretty good, you know? Mm -hmm. So therefore, he's got to get that recognition. He's got to get and, that recognition. And then in the third <laughs> round, the only one you had, you gave a 22 was uh, Chris. You thought he was the best. In which round? In the posing round. Well, come on. <laughs> Chris Dickerson, I mean, forget right. it, you know. But here's the thing. You know what I did not like about Franco? What? Can you guess? His posing? His posing was okay. Actually, his posing was pretty good. Okay. He also did classical music. and Right. He, 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 he handled it pretty well. But take a look at the physique. Oh, the guy knows. Exactly. Yeah. I couldn't get past the guy know. Right. Like, to me, if you're a judge, you're going to say to the world, this is the best physique. In the world. And then, boom, you've got a big bitch tit. Right. I can't, I can't go. I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. I can't do it. Minus the bitch tits. I might have given him first because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he was in good condition. Right. But that was it. You see, to me, these guys are coming on stage. They're the best bodybuilders in the world. They've got a little money behind them. Mm -hmm. If you're doing, if you're doing stuff, you got bitch tits. Go see a doctor. Yeah. Get it taken care of. Right. Don't come on my stage and show this to the world because that's not, you know, that's not a good image that's exactly. not willing to present to the world. So when they announced the results at the end, were you surprised at where everybody placed? Well, you know what? I wasn't surprised, and I'll tell you why. Because as one of the architects of the judging system, and then, of course, that was the last time we used that judging system from the next year, we went to what we use now, which is called the MUST system. Okay. The MUST system is if we've got 15 bodybuilders on stage, you must place them 1 to 15. Right. There's no, there's no two firsts and two seconds and two thirds. You know what I mean? Right, right. You must make a decision who's first, who's second, who's third, all the way down to 15th. Yeah. And so that system works best. So that's the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Judging system that allowed people to get two scores of 20 or two scores of 19 or 18 or whatever, because yeah. you, can't, you can't make the decision and you don't want to make the decision, so you let it come out in the wash. Right. So here, here's the thing. The way I look at it is this, that the, um, we've got seven judges, and uh, whatever it comes out, you say, I'm not going to criticize a judge. I'm going to say that's what we came up with, and that's the result. Yeah. Were you surprised and, at the audience's reaction? Absolutely not. No? The, okay. Uh, the and that's the job of the audience. The yeah. audience is supposed to react the way they see fit. Uh -huh. And if they dislike your result, they dislike your result. Right. And, they, you know, because, you know, and I'll tell you something, what I did a couple of times. 
I, I was judging at, at the at the Arnold one time, for instance, mm-hmm. and I had an occasion where I was able to go and sit about ten rows back. Okay. And look at the bodybuilders. Yeah. And I was I was shocked. What the audience sees is not what we see. Yeah. Yeah. Right at the front. Right. I mean, we see every hair sticking out of a guy's leg. Right. Right. We're that close. Mm-hmm. They don't actually see what the judges see. Yeah, now, that's what, true. now what we've done, if you know what the, the, the Olympias now, what we've done, we moved the judges back about six rows. Yeah, that's true. Now, we're not right in the front anymore. Right. It gives us a little bit more of an objective view of what the audience sees. And we have those dividers between the judges so that the judges don't and can't collaborate. And the judges can't see each other's score. Not that people cheat, but yeah. you, know, you can't see each other's scores. Right. You know? I've had situations where there was a guy named Julian Feinstein from England, a judge. Uh-huh. And we were judging in the uh, Mandalay Bay. I don't remember what year it was. And at the end of the prejudging, he could not make a decision. Hmm. And I, I, I said to him, listen, just put it down the way you see it. Just put it down. Write it down now, now, now. And yeah. the, on this case, hand in your sheet. Come on, come on. Give me the sheet. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> right. You know? It's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. A lot of pressure. And I remember sitting with... Um, I think it was Rich Gaspari I was judging next to another year in Mandalay Bay. And we came down to the, the pre-judging. You remember this event. It was between Ronnie Coleman and Jay Cutler. Okay. What year was that? They were like close. Yeah. Uh, was it 2001 the first time? It could have been. Yeah. But here's the thing. I had I scored... Jay Cutler first, Ronnie second. So Richard was sitting next to me, and he hadn't handed in his score sheet. Uh-huh. And I said, I said, I said, Richard, let's go, let's go. You know? He says, he says, he says, I have to make a decision. I said, Well, make the decision. <laughs> he says, Yeah, but he says, but if I make the decision that I'm thinking, I'm going to give Ronnie second. I'm going to dethrone the current Olympia. Yeah. I said, oh, well, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. If that's what you think, that's why you're a judge. That's what you think. Put it down the way you see it. And I don't know what decision he made finally, Mm -hmm. but he made the decision and handed in a sheet. It's not as easy as people think. No, no, I've judged many years myself, and uh, it, it is very tough sometimes. You know, I get a, John, I get a great laugh out of people. And the, I see guys come to the show, and some of them are huge, and they're like, excuse me, as they're walking into the aisle, excuse <laughs> me, excuse me, and they sit down. And they look at the guys on stage, and they go, oh, I could have beaten him. Yeah. I could have beaten him. And they so, yeah, you think so? <laughs> right now, you're riding around 250. If you were to get in shape and drop 25, 30 pounds off that fat body, Right. You have no idea what you're going to look like. Right. You know what I mean? And as you mentioned, it's a lot of how you present yourself, too. You know, it's not just how your physique looks, but how you present yourself on stage. Exactly. 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 People don't get that. No, they don't understand how hard it is at all. They don't. They really, really don't understand. I remember once I judged a show in Winnipeg. It was a Mr. Canada. And we judged it outside in front uh, on a uh, swimming pool. And I saw this one bodybuilder in the lineup. John, symmetry-wise, he was dark tan, good-looking. Mm-hmm. I said to myself, oh, my gosh, this guy's going to win. Mm. And then came the compulsory poses. And the guy completely disappeared. Yeah. I go, what the heck happened? <laughs> Where did he go? Right. He didn't even place top three, for God's sake. Right, right. It's amazing. 
So people don't get that. You might have a guy coming. You know, one, what, one of the things I noticed over the years, I remember at, at some of the shows in Atlanta, Georgia in particular, I was in the lobby and you'd see all the bodybuilders in lobby of hotel walking around. And you'd go, hmm, that guy looks in shape. Like, you know, and they're looking huge and so on. Right. And I remember seeing um, a couple of bodybuilders walking by and they they got big bags of potatoes and different things. They're eating and munching and their cheeks are bulging <laughs> and they look huge. And Sean Ray walked by and he looked like he fell out of GQ magazine. <laughs> and you look at that and you say, that's the guy that's going to do well. Yeah, yeah. It's not the guy that looks all big in his sweatsuit who's going to look great on stage. It isn't. Exactly, right. The guy that looks that nice, lean look, like Lee Labrada used to look, like Sean Ray yeah. used to look. Yeah. These are the guys that are going to do well. Right. And then Dorian walked through. Oh, shit. <laughs> You know, you know he's coming ready. Yeah. In every way. He wins I want to tell, quick... okay, tell you a quick story about Chris Dickerson. Okay. So in 1981, you know how he came out. He got second. Yeah. So the next summer, Chris phoned me up. He says, Winston, I want to get your advice. I said, okay, what do you want to know, Chris? He says, do you think I should go into the 1982 Mr. Olympia? I said, I don't know why you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. He said, well, the judges don't seem to like me. Hmm. I said, what are you talking about? You're one of the greatest bodybuilders up there. You got to go out and compete. He says, okay. Why would you say that? So I said to him, I said this. I said, listen, Chris, bodybuilders take competing in the wrong way. They should look at it the way the tennis players look at how they play. Tennis players don't just play in the U.S. Open. They don't just play at Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. They have tournaments in China and Australia and different places. We don't always hear the results. Mm-hmm. But they're out there playing. And what what they're concerned with is how much money they made for the year. <laughs> right. That's what they're concerned is if they might come second in a tournament or third, and they might win another one, and they're accumulating their points and accumulating their money. Mm-hmm. I said, that's the way bodybuilders should look at it. If you go to a show like the Olympia, uh, you go to the Arnold's, you come second or third. I would say, how much money did I make? And I'm a businessman. Mm-hmm. How much money did I make? Okay, I'm going to try to make a little bit more in the next show and so on. And he said, you know, by the gods, I think you're right. <laughs> I'm going to enter. <laughs> so, And that's why he entered the show. Right, and he won. I'm going to go. Yeah. I did I did a little bit of analysis, okay, John? You mm-hmm. probably did too. Of the results of the Mr. of the 81 Olympia. Okay. And when if you if you took out the, the the 20 scores, take that away, right? All right. And look at it from a point of view of placing. Franco ended up with three first placing. Mhm. Two seconds a third and a fifth. Okay. If you do the elimination, you cancel out the top score, so okay. one of his first placings goes out, mm-hmm. and his third place is taken out. He ends up with an aggregate score of 11. Okay. You look at Chris Dickerson. Chris Dickerson had two first placings, two seconds, a third, and two fourths. Sorry, I made I made a mistake here. I made. A you're, you're crossing out the um, the high and the lows, right? Yeah, that's right. Hang on, okay. hang on a second. Two, four, six, nine. Okay. So, Chris Dickerson ends up with an aggregate score of eleven. 
Okay. Frank ended up with an aggregate score of nine, by the way. Okay. That's two, four, six, nine, yeah. And Tommy had two seconds, three fourths, and two thirds. Hmm. So he ends up, when you take out a second, take out a fourth, he ends up with an aggregate score of 16. Okay. Roy Callender had a first, one first, three seconds, one third, and two fourths. You take out a first and a fourth, he ends up with an aggregate score of 13. Okay. So technically, maybe he should have been third, maybe. Let's see, four and four, eight and six, one, two, 16. And Roy ended up with two, four, six, nine, 13, yeah. Danny Padilla ended up with one third and all fifth scores. Hmm. When you took out the third and one of the fifths, he ends up with an aggregate score of 25. Wow. Now, Roy Callender did not pick up any first place scores in the final pose down. Mm -hmm. But right, Franco, right. Franco ended up with two first place, Dickerson with two first place, mm -hmm. and Platts with two first place. Right. So that Danny got one. Danny and Danny got one. Right. So it's in the wash when it comes out in the wash. Mm -hmm. it comes out that Franco was still the competitor who ends up with the most favor. Right. From the judges. Hmm. That's interesting. I look at that. I said it's interesting to see, but. Maybe the guy who got bummed out here was Platt, was um, Roy Callender, who maybe should have been third instead of fourth, if you look at it from that point of view. Right, right. So, yeah, you were going, so anyway, you were going to ask me another question. With all your experience and all your years and all the bodybuilders you've seen, can you name uh, one or two that have really stood out, whether it was a bodybuilder and his peak <laughs> condition or, or a contest that really stood out for you? Here's something that I've always thought, and I actually wrote an article about it for Flex Magazine one time. To me, the greatest bodybuilder the world has ever seen. Well, let me ask you that question. Who is the greatest bodybuilder you think you've ever seen? Hmm. Apart from yourself, because you were great too. <laughs> I, wish, I wish we'd seen you in the IFBB. Yeah, me too. Especially well, as a natural bodybuilder. Yeah. I want to tell you, I was a natural bodybuilder, never took uh -huh. anything. And I used to squat with eight plates with no problem. Wow, that's amazing. Especially for and a tall guy. Bench with six and a half. Wow. So anyway, so um, I I didn't believe in the idea of taking steroids. So That's, a, that's I, impressive. Yeah. But, well, you know, I mean, I, I just didn't like the idea, you know? Yeah. Well, I would say the most impressive guy I think I ever seen in person, not on stage, but was uh, Sergio Oliva. So I used to see him a lot in Chicago. Okay. 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 Well, I want to tell you my favorite. Okay. To me, the best bodybuilder. Well, let me preface it by saying it's Paul Dillette. Okay. I'd listen to different people, including myself, and trained the right way and completed his development with his back and everything. Yeah. Nobody would have beaten that guy. No, I agree. Nobody should have beaten Paul Dillette if he had learned to train properly and pose properly. But that said, to me, the greatest bodybuilder in terms of symmetry, proportion, size, all those things we talked about. Okay. Is Bill Pearl. Bill Pearl, okay, great. I never got to see Bill in person. I did get to see Bill in person. I knew him personally, and he's such a gentleman, had such a fabulous physique. Mm -hmm. And um, it's unfortunate because when he was in his peak, he decided that he would not compete in the IFPB. He didn't, right. he didn't have a trust for the weeders. Yeah. He thought they were crooks and so on. 
and he refused to compete in the IFBB. But I met him later on. He did judge for us many times. Mm -hmm. and I spent time with him at his home in Medford, Oregon. Great gentleman, great physique. What show did you see him at, Winston? Actually, I never saw him compete because oh, okay. he didn't compete after he won Mr. America. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, he did, but he was competing with Naba, right? Right. I think his last he show was, was in 71. In, yeah, his last show was 71. And when you look at his record, he was Mr. America in 1953. Right. He was Mr. America... Sorry, he was Mr. Universe. I'm trying to get it right here. I think he was Mr. Universe in 1961. Mm -hmm. And then he was Mr. Universe, NABA, in 1966. And then he was Mr. Universe, NABA, in 1971. Right. Do you know of any bodybuilder, including Arnold, who could have competed with gaps of three, four years in between, yeah, and still taking the show. I know he's, he was competing in different generations, and he was still proving himself the best. Exactly. Yeah, he he was amazing. And I've talked to Arnold, bodybuilders that saw him pose, you know, at posing exhibitions, and they said he was just incredible to see on stage. They said the oh, presence I've, he had was unbelievable. I've seen him do several exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And he's he's just a master poser. He's just fantastic. Yeah. He's a great, great bodybuilder. To me, very much overlooked. But he made his money, and he's very happy. And yeah. he lives up in Oregon on that uh, little estate that he has. He's, he's a pretty happy guy. Yeah, and he's a great gentleman, too. I've, I've met him many times, and oh, he's, he's just a real, real great he's, person. He's a, he's a prince. He's a prince. Yeah. Arnold, yes. Arnold is probably one of the smartest, probably the smartest competitor that has ever competed. You know what his weaknesses were, right? Mm hmm His legs were never big enough. Right. That's basically it. His legs needed to come up another inch or two. Right. And um, other than that, he was pretty perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I could have saw him compete, too. I never got a chance to see Arnold on stage. Yeah, I, I've, um, I've judged him. I judged him in 1974. Really? Wow, that had to be amazing. In New York. Uh-huh. At that Olympia, and there's no question he was... That's the best condition that I've seen him in. Yeah. He was 232 or 34 that day. Uh-huh. It was perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I would have loved in to see that. In South Africa, he was 25. Right. And um, that was 1975. Right. And But you know what, what was smart about Arnold? He knew that he wasn't and that his legs were a weakness. Mm hmm And I kept my eye on him all the time. Mm-hmm. And there was only one or two seconds that he allowed his legs to relax on stage. Hmm. And he pulled them right back in, back up. <laughs> right, right. Smart, smart guy. Yeah, absolutely. He knew one of the best. He knew how to handle himself on stage. Yeah, for sure. It was amazing. And well, he had a great, great back and his yeah. most muscular and then his special... Side pose that he did was those were all great, 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 great poses. You know, there was a guy who knew how to present his body, right? He knew how he knew how to present the body. But you see, the smart thing, you know, Arnold's a smart guy, and I'll get to I'll give you two reasons why. Number one, he hired a dancing, a ballet dancer to help him learn how to pose. Right. And number two, even way back when you phoned. To, to buy products from Arnold. He used to sell belts and tank tops uh -huh. and stuff. He had an agency answering his phone. Hmm. <laughs> and a lot of the bodybuilders, even today, yeah. they answer their own phones. Right. Like they don't even think of hiring somebody to, 
people on the agency to work for them. Right, right. And if the guy's gone to the gym, he's working out, then he's not going to answer the phone. Right. You, you can get a hold of him, and you can buy the products that he's offering. Right. And then he comes back home, and he's eating, and then he's got to sleep. And right. During all those times, you can't get a hold of the guy. Right, exactly. Arnold, Arnold was so smart, he had this agency working for him. He could always order stuff. Yeah. Leave him messages. Smart guy. Yeah, I think to this day he's showing that he's he did more for bodybuilding or with bodybuilding than anyone else, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Well Winston, I want to thank you for uh for joining us. It was a pleasure talking to you. You have an amazing uh career and amazing life in the in the field of bodybuilding and I could talk to you forever because you got so many great stories and uh it's been great to hear your stories and to hear your views on the 81 Olympia, thank you for being honest about that. It was really a great conversation. Yeah, and, and you know what? And I just want to say one more thing about um, the bodybuilders of mm-hmm. today. We, we touched on it. Somebody really has to get to those guys, and the message has to be sent. We've got to get rid of those guts. Absolutely. We need to bring it back the way they used to look. Well, maybe not. I think the size is really great. I think the size is, is fantastic and it's quite mm-hmm. important. But they've got to have, they've got to get rid of the of the bellies and they've got to pay more attention to stimulation. You see, like Big Rami, huge quads and these small calves. Yeah. Can't be the best physique in the world. Right, right. But okay, when... still love bodybuilding. It's great. Yeah. Nice to talk to you. It was great to talk to you, too. And uh, happy birthday this week. I know yesterday was your birthday, right? Yesterday. Thank you so much. All right. You're welcome. Okay. All right, Winston. Thanks for joining us. I hope we get to talk to you again. I look forward to it. All right. Take care. You too. All right. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. This concludes season three, which was the 1981 Mr. Olympia. I hope you enjoyed all our interviews with Roger Schwab and Danny Padilla and Jim Raquel, John Balick, and also photographer Gary Bartlett. Roy Callender, of course, and today we talked to Winston Roberts. I enjoyed uh, talking to all those guys about the 1981 Mr. Olympia. And as I said, season four will be about the 1990 Mr. Olympia, which was the drug test of Mr. Olympia. So thank you again to our sponsors, Redcon One, Old School Labs, and Florida Alternative Medicine for sponsoring the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. We will see you guys next week. Take care. Okay.